hate the dentist. I don't want to be here. I'm going to get out of this jail as soon as possible. Yeah. But by the end of the whole journey, once I saw the transformation in myself, I was just like, I want to do this. I want to make a change, a positive change in somebody's life. If I can do it this way, I would certainly aim for that. I want to do this. This is something I would want for a living to be able to create a happy smile. <laughs> Hi everyone and welcome back to the Homework Help Show Student Influencers Podcast. I'm your host Leslie and today I'm with Arushi. So welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, So usually we get started we do some get to know you demographic kind of questions first. Uh, So where are you currently located and where were you born and raised? I have had a wonderful journey like I'm I'm just 28 years old and I'm turning 28 this year. And I've traveled all across India. So I was born and brought up in Shimla. That's like the north part of India. And my dad was in the army and he retired as a colonel. So I got a chance to be and raised all across north, east, west and south. From Jammu and Kashmir to New Delhi, the capital city of India. To east being in Assam in Shillong, that's Meghalaya. And then I was in west in Rajasthan and had a brief time to stay in Gujarat and then we went to Bangalore that's Karnataka part of south so from there I've been raised everywhere and then I moved after getting married I moved to New Delhi I stayed there for two years and then my husband decided to move to Canada and we had a roller coaster journey here as well being new immigrants <laughs> finding a job finding an accommodation for ourselves and initially we weren't able to find a long-term accommodation being like we would and the size of our jobs. So we changed our cities from Mississauga to North York to we went to Hamilton and then we moved back to North York. Now we're currently at Bayview. So for one year we have been here and I'm liking it so far yeah. and been blessed to come to the country. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, did it take you kind of a long time? I know that sometimes uh, it takes quite a while to get everything organized and, and kind of find your footing in an, in when you come from anywhere to Canada. So did it kind of take a while for that or? Yes, it did. Uh, coming from a medical background, I'm a dentist from India. So I had to go undergo licensing and I'm still undergoing the licensing procedure. So finding a career that I can do, I'll get into because dentistry is what I knew and I could, I'm, that's my forte. Getting into a new field, field would have been challenging so my husband and his family and my parents have been very supportive. I took up uh, the NDA the examination. I challenged the dental assisting board examination and became a dental assistant and I'm currently working as a dental assistant at Lakeview Dentistry that's at Port Credit again in Mississauga and apart from that uh, now due to COVID due to reduced uh, working hours I'm working as an office manager with an optometrist. So yes it has been challenging for me to balance both things and like it's all because, because of the licensing procedure. I know it's a yeah. long way to go, but but I'm very happy and fortunate that I'm still in my field and doing what I love to. Yeah, that is kind huge. of, yeah, like that is kind of uh, the issue sometimes is you kind of have to uh, recertify, basically get recertified and retake um, all of those tests and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. That's true. So I'm, I'm prepared for that. <laughs> That's not a problem. But the thing is, yes, it's time consuming. And uh, my exams have been getting delayed because of COVID. But then, yeah, it's just been a year. So I'm focused to achieve that goal. Yeah, that's I know. I mean, it'll be so satisfying when it's all done. And when you're it's all set to go, it'll be kind of a relief. Yes, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Uh, so did you, so you obviously went to university uh, in India, which school did you go to? So I went to Subharti University, that's in Uttar Pradesh, and I did my graduation, I started in 2012 and finished in 2015, so five-year course in India to become a Bachelor of Dental Surgery, and in this whole five-year course, we, the first initial years are foundation years where you're taught medical and dental anatomy and the medical uh, 
like everything about the medicines. And then the third year onwards, it's all about dental, dental materials, be it materials, be it your prosthodontics, orthodontics, periodology, everything. So I got a chance to have hands-on experience with the patients. We had like theoretical time and then a clinical time where we used to treat the patients and be supervised by our professors to enhance the skills clinically. And in the final year, we were given a hand to work independently in a clinical setup as to make us ready for the real world. Okay, so, yeah, so it's kind of like all um, a dentistry program that kind of puts everything all into the, the same like program? Yes, everything in the same program. So uh, I know it's different in uh, US and Canada that you have to have prerequisites and that you go for a science and then you do your graduation and then you go for your, like a DDS program. Mm -hmm. But India, it's more of like you pass your 12th grade, you challenge the examinations to get into a medical or a dental school and then you undergo a five-year program. That's like, it has everything in one five-year program. So it's a professional course and once you are certified, you are a Bachelor of Dentistry, Dental Surgery, and then you are ready to work as a full-fledged dentist. And if you wish, you can like go for your master's. That's a three-year program to specialize in a particular uh, field. Right. So the master's would be something you would specialize in. So like a certain aspect of dentistry. So like, or I, or th I was trying to think of a, an area, but I was like, I don't know anything about dentistry. <laughs> just I'll give a brief idea so dentistry is divided into nine parts okay and so we have community dentistry we have pediatric dentistry to do with like dentists specializing to do dental work on kids so that's a full field in itself then we have oral maxillofacial surgery where you can treat the full face and jaw anything to do with head and neck so those are like proper dent like surgeons all the surgery extractions and everything people who get their RCTs, root canal treatments, or cavities, they go to an endodontist. And then there's periodontists who go for the gum diseases. Then there's proxodontists who go for their dentures or their implants or something like that. There is like a lot of things. So <laughs> there is um, oral pathology, underlying diseases. So yeah, like and, um, not to miss out, then you have oral radiology. That's very important something that's not visible to the naked eye, you have to find it through the radiographs. So like that, every specialization is important to dentistry. And so are the people who are into it, yeah. Yeah, I didn't realize there were so many different areas of dentistry. <laughs> yes, it is. It is um, intimidating. Like initially, if I would like as a 12th grade student, I was like, oh, it's dentistry, it's only about to do three. But once I got into the school and once I started to know more is when I realized, oh, it's not just one aspect. It's you have to think so many ways. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah Cause now that I'm thinking about it too, like that makes sense because some aspects of, de of like, to me, that would make up dentistry would be like, obviously taking care of your teeth and stuff, but then there are like surgical elements to it and all kinds of stuff like that. So like, it is interesting to think about that. Um, what kind? What made you get into dentistry? Like, did you kind of always wanted to be a dentist, or was it something that you kind of chose a little later? Like, how did you end up on that path? That's an interesting story. So, as a child, um, that's why the first word came out of my mouth was orthodontics, because that was my first interaction with a dentist was with an orthodontist who did my braces to have this beautiful smile. <laughs> so he fascinated me a lot. Like, I used to. I was just uh, in the ninth grade that time and my one and a half year that I had been, I had regular visits with him. I loved the way he worked, his work ethics, the way he dressed up in that white coat. He looked so handsome. <laughs> also, and the work culture and the way he managed time, the instruments and everything and the environment in itself was so neat and clean that it just intrigued me that I want to do this. This is something I would want for a living to be able to create happy smiles and make people happy once they leave. Because as soon as a patient sits on your chair, the first thing they say is, I hate the dentist. I don't want to be here. I want to get out of this jail as soon as possible. Yeah. But by the end of the whole journey, once I saw the transformation in myself, I was just like, I want to do this. I want to make 
a change, a positive change in somebody's life. If I can do it this way, I would certainly aim for that. And also like I come from a family of doctors. So I was always into it. Like I want to be a doctor, but do I want to be a surgeon? Do I want to be a gynecologist or maybe a cardiologist or something like that? But I wasn't sure. But dentistry was something I was sure from right from the ninth grade. That I'll be honest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that is something that like uh, even just someone's smile can have such a big impact on their own. Uh, their confidence or their self-esteem and and you hear people all the time like oh I don't like smiling in pictures because I don't like my spot my smile so it is probably really nice to be able to kind of help out in that aspect and say hey I can help you feel more confident and feel better about yourself that's true that's true like it just um like your beauty or anything just enhances multiples yeah, definitely. That makes total sense. And that's a really great reason to want to do that because, you know, a lot of people would choose a profession in the medical field, obviously for one of the obvious reasons would be because the pay is really good. But with those kind of professions, like you kind of have to be passionate about helping people to, to really be able to make a difference in that way. So that's a really good, um, yeah. So that's a really great reason to do that. Um, so what kind of advice would you give to a student who maybe is um, starting to think about a career in dentistry or even uh, is already maybe in their first year and not really sure what to expect? So with my experience, I would say um, I wasn't aware enough because I didn't have a lot of dentists in my family or I didn't have that much interaction with the dentist that how the real world is or how dentistry and any other thing is all about but the thing was once I got into it I knew it's not just about the studies it's not just about doing that work perfectly mastering your and remembering and memorizing everything it's all about your physical fitness too it is a demanding job you need to be up and about and you need to be reading all the time you need to be updated with the technology like when I started there was not so, so much awareness about having a perfect aligned smile nowadays which is so accessible we have smile maker and whatnot in these developed countries so that is not so accessible in other countries still but you have to know both aspects not just theoretically but what is coming with the time so you need to update your knowledge and be prepared to be physically uh, giving it all because it's a tedious process. You're working on a very small working area. It's not a lot of space that you have. It's a limited amount of space. Like I, I have a very small job opening. I, I know it. I give a dentist a hard time. Keeping the patient motivated to be in your chair for an hour and a half for a cavity filling. So you need to be a good, have, have good personal skills like you should have a personal communication skill have a rapport with the patient build them build their trust in you so all these things should also be in a mind if a, if a person is choosing this career it's not only about making money I know people do choose careers based on that that okay I put a certain amount of hours and I would be making this but also with added responsibility that it's not just you're doing your work, but you're doing it correctly and ethically. Yeah, that kind of, I, uh, now that I kind of think about it, that is like, it is, is, I mean, obviously someone's mouth, like you said, is not a very big area. So be, having to kind of train your hands and your body to just kind of focus on that one small area for an hour or two at a time is pr probably pretty sore on like your muscles and stuff too, I bet. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and dentists probably. are like famous to have going to yeah for like the tendonitis and their cervical problems. That's very common with the dentist for sure because you're bending and you're like because everybody is different. Not everybody can like keep the mouth open for that much of amount of time, and you have to like make your way through to treat them because yeah you have to make them comfortable as well as you need to get the work done in that amount of time. So you you should be prepared. Yeah. And that's the main advice I would give anybody that be mentally prepared to keep your body healthy. If your body is healthy, your mind and everything will automatically be healthy. Yeah, that's true. And I mean, like that. the body and the mind are so connected too, right? Yeah. 
so it's, I mean, if your, if your mind is, or if your body's exhausted, then your, your mind's going to quickly follow and vice versa. So just being up on all of that, but also to, um, I think that's also an important point of knowing, uh, an important skill of knowing how to make people feel comfortable because like you said, not a lot of, it's pretty common for people to not enjoy going to the dentist. So that's, that's the most common line I hear, like a person who just come to your chair and say, oh, I hate the dentist. I don't want to be here. And when you start on that note, if you're not mentally strong or a positive person, the things cannot go right, right? And you have to build that relationship with the patient that he comes back to you. He trusts in you that you can treat and do a proper treatment plan for them because it's not just about one filling or just one cleaning. You need to work on different aspects in a mouth too. So yeah, you have to have that patience in yourself and that I would say the calmness in yourself to deal with that situation and have, I think a dentist should also have a sense of humor, <laughs> to be honest, to keep them entertained for that long amount of time. Yeah, you should be. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be super helpful. Like, I mean, I know like my dentist is kind of pretty just like straight personality, kind of just like gets in, gets out, whatever. And I feel like yeah. if it would be a lot more easy, it would be a lot more comfortable if to have a dentist who actually just is, uh, has a bit of a sense of humor just to make you like laugh a little bit and to because everyone feels a little more comfortable when they're when someone can make them laugh yeah, totally totally agree on that yeah or even just being only like the needles <laughs> so, yeah. yeah well I mean those needles are <laughs> large and I mean I, I'm someone who is not comfortable with needles and terrified of needles and so every time I've had to get a cavity it's just like like you're just terrified I'm, yeah so that's probably that's a challenge true, too so for yeah. dentists like having to uh come at someone with this huge needle that they're terrified of and trying to figure out how to make them not panic because obviously you they have to stay still at the same time yes <laughs> because it's again like i said it's a small intricate area and the machines that we're working with like the hand instrument the endomotor and everything they have a rotation as fast as that of a plane, if I would say. So you're working on a tooth with so many vibrations, you don't want the patient to like close. It's going to be a disaster. So yes, you have to make them so comfortable that they trust and they keep their mouth open for that long amount of time and you get the work done on time. So yes. <laughs> yeah, and I feel like that's a skill that you kind of have to develop on your own. They're not going to just teach you in class how to do that I feel like you have to kind of develop your own way of doing that yes because uh like I said every human is different every every patient is different everybody's nature is different so you have to have a good judgment that would be like something that comes within a person if you're aware of your surroundings you're aware how can you just make the situation better how can you just like make your way through their mind what what's making them anxious even it's just talking about common things or something that you can talk their way out because 90 percent of the time it's just talking and that the problem is gone um so kind of what are some of your i know that we you kind of did uh touch on this a little but uh what are kind of your short and long-term goals so i'm assuming the short-term goals are kind of getting that finishing up that certification here in canada yes that's my short-term goal for sure uh, to get my license, to work as a dentist. And then with my long-term goals, I would certainly want to have my own setup. That's my dream. I really want to have a own setup, be a business woman and run the whole thing by myself. That's my long-term goal. Maybe in five, six years, but yes, that's definitely my plan. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like a good, it's pretty, it's always good to have something like that to work toward, especially since you did kind of come here and, and give yourself kind of like a, a fresh start, so to speak. So you, that is a really, really good starting point for that kind of thing, because you can, you can do whatever you want. Every country works in a different aspect. The industry doesn't change much, but then the work environment and the policies and everything else does. So working as a dental assistant and a patient treatment coordinator, I learned a lot about how to run a dental practice. So those are the things I would say, even if I'm not working as a dentist, I'm working as a patient coordinator or a dental assistant, I'm still learning 
how to run a clinic. So those things I can keep to myself and then use them later in my life when I have my own practice. So nothing goes in waste. I say this to everybody, not, nothing that you do goes to waste. <laughs> Yeah, I, th- I always agree with that. Like any skill you learn, even if it's not really relevant to anything, it, it's always helpful and you're always going to be able to do something with it, right? Right, definitely. And the other job that I work with as a store manager, I'm able to do like the retail part or may- meet people from different ethnicities. So it's I'm not limited to my own people. I'm like interacting with more multicultural people I'm able to understand their likes their dislikes and how a person thinks so I have a you tend to learn a lot when you talk to people honestly like a lot about Canada is something that I learned not from Google not from watching YouTube videos nothing but from interacting with people I didn't get a lot of chance because we came in July and then the lockdown happened and like not I couldn't interact much but then the whatever amount of time I could interact with them on work or at a store, I would just make most of it by talking to them because the culture and everything is what you learn from meeting people. That's for sure. Yeah. And another thing too, is like the job that you're doing now will also really help you because if you do open your own practice, running a dental practice is probably a lot like running a business so you're going to have that experience sure. you're yeah. now to help you with that later, which is really great too. True. With everything right from how to have a setup to your sterilization, to managing your inventory, to managing your staff, the payroll, everything is, every skill is important to run a practice. It's not just about the dentistry, but being a good businessman as well at the end of the day. Yeah, and organize. the profits. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Because it, it, I mean, it is basically the same, like, it's not the same, same thing, but it, it is a business at the end of the day. So that makes total sense. Yeah. You think you're doing work, you're giving a service, but yes, you have to have a good balance. For everyone. Yeah, definitely. Um, so when you were taking school um, or in university in India, and I'm not, and I'm obviously I'm not super familiar with what it's like to go to university in India but while you were there did you kind of have did you do any kind of extracurriculars or were you involved in anything else while you were while you were doing your degree yes so like with the college we had a program that was specially focusing on the underprivileged people around our university so we had a lot of villages and rural areas where we used to take our like we had a van which was modified into a moving dental clinic so we would go volunteer like we would a batch of five every other day we would shuffle up and go to different areas to give them services and also educate them about basic oral hygiene a lot of people weren't privileged enough to come to the city and get the treatment done so our college took the initiative to make them aware and to treat them so that was one main part i was involved with and i quite enjoy doing it and also I learned that how these people are like still meeting their ends and not able to like focus on their health. Like oral health still has to be, we still need a lot of awareness about oral health. And that was one part I really liked educating them that how important it is to have a good oral health in order to have a good body health. So that's what I did in college and then uh, after I came here, I've very much like been working and being able to educate the patients again. And yeah, just being part of learning the culture and everything and telling them, yeah, this is right for you and this is not. So you should avoid these habits. <laughs> yeah, that sounds really fulfilling and rewarding. And also too, like, yeah, like a lot of people don't realize how connected your teeth are to your overall health and Um, all other, like uh, so many other areas of your health are directly connected to your teeth. And I think, I feel like a lot of people, if they don't have um, that education, they don't really understand why it's so important to go and take care of your teeth or just like, okay, it's just my teeth. Well, no, it's not really just your teeth. (laughs) Exactly. Because people, if like, suppose I give an example, they have a gut issue they would definitely show signs 
on the teeth. The teeth would be brittle, they would break easily, they would chip, and either they would have like yellowing of the teeth, but they wouldn't realize it's something to do with their gut. Vice versa, if they are smokers or they are into substance abuse or something like that, that would show signs in the oral mouth. So it can lead to oral cancer. That's like extreme of it. And there are oral lesions which can cause irritation or burning sensation in the mouth. And these things can lead to different other health issues later on. So educating them about how they can improve on that is actually satisfying. And I have seen people going into tobacco cessation programs and such like over a period of one year and they have seen a drastic improvement. And that has been really rewarding that I could change somebody's life, not just like creating a good smile for them, but overall health as well. Yeah. So kind of helping them on the inside and the outside. Just yeah. Everything. Yeah. That's, that's pretty yeah. awesome. Um, did you work as well when you were in school? So I worked uh, after I finished my school. So I worked at, as an intern in my college itself. And then we used to be posted to different departments and we could do the specialization and focus on, on that one particular area. That's how I learned a lot. And after I graduated, I worked in a government center set up where I had almost like 100, 150 patients per day. So I got a lot of exposure there. That was in Delhi itself, in Malana Azad. And then I worked into a private practice where I learned more about the cosmetic part of dentistry, where people were more interested of how the teeth can look whiter, brighter, and have those kind of things. But yeah, it was bad. like I could do the treatment part and the cosmetic part yeah, so you kind of worked in a few different areas to just kind of give yourself a more well-rounded approach. So you kind of dabbled in a little bit of everything. Yes, that's what my aim was. Like, because dentistry in India is evolving. It's always been evolving. And like right now, the cosmetic part, they are going into veneers. They're going into Invisaligns, which is all about having straight, beautiful smiles. It's all about having like tooth jewelry and stuff, stuff like that. And also like, Botox is being introduced, so it's not just limited to the teeth, it's more now head and neck. It's about your overall features and like balanced faces. So it's it's interesting. It's like I said, evolving and there's so much scope to learn. There's so much. Yeah, I've actually been hearing a lot about Invisalign lately, just a lot more people mentioning it more often. So I mean that's yeah. that's probably true. That's true. And uh, one interesting fact I would like to tell is it's not about always having a straight mind, but having a perfect occlusion. So a lot of people get misled into, oh, if your teeth are perfect, if your teeth are straight, it's, it's the right thing to have. No, you should have a perfect occlusion. If your teeth are touching either, each other, the main, like I would say, the role of the teeth is to grind the food properly. People don't understand the part that if you're not able to chew properly, you can have other problems like a TMJ problem or like a, people say, I have a headache. Like that doesn't make sense. Why do you have a headache? They won't be able to like figure out, oh, it's because I'm not able to have a proper bite. Those things show when you're aging and it gets worse. So having a proper teeth alignment helps you have a proper occlusion. So a person should actually focus on the like the uh, productive part like in a sense like having a perfect occlusion alignment of the teeth rather than the smile but yeah it's okay if people will learn <laughs> we have to educate them more yeah because it's so basically just because your teeth are straight doesn't mean that they're like they it might not mean they're quite properly aligned or vice versa like just having straight teeth is not really the determinant of how healthy they are, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. That's, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. Because I would say, like, even the social media misleads you to these gimmicks. Like, having whiter teeth, or they don't realize, like, over-whitening of the teeth can lead to teeth sensitivity. If you're, like, saying, I want to get my teeth whitened, it doesn't happen overnight. You have to go under certain sessions. But at the cost of, if you're going for cheaper products and not by the professional, they end up making the teeth even more weak instead of making them look healthier they actually turn out to be weaker so people have to do some research it's you shouldn't just go by what you see in a magazine or you see a seller getting this done or promoting that done rather than you should actually consult a 
professional a dentist to tell them if it's even required or not because this is the thing like a lot of ethnicities we have different enamel and dentin uh, concentrations so a teeth turns out to be yellow when you start aging it doesn't mean it's not healthy it's just that the dentin part is like getting more darker mm-hmm. and that's when your teeth turns out to be darker it necessarily does not mean that you have to get a whitening but yeah that's the thing that you have to make the patient understand that part that it's not all about the cosmetic but also about the functional part too right like it's always not just a pretty white shiny or shiny a, pr- a bright white smile it's about how your teeth actually function yes again yeah, it's you know what it's really interesting to kind of think about that because we always think about how you know the the beauty standards that, that the media kind of pushes on people and it's always these beauty and it's always whenever people talk about it it's the biggest thing people talk about is always like body image and you know um certain ideal body types but it's kind of like what you're saying is kind of making me think about how that concept of that applies to so many other things that you don't really realize that those beauty standards damage so many other areas that we don't even realize it's just so widespread yes that's true. that's the role of like being a professional that one has to work on being making people more aware and not yeah. get into the trap yeah yeah and not just get distracted by just really wanting to have white teeth instead of and then going and buying like the cheapest teeth whitening on sale at the drugstore and then ripping the enamel off your teeth (laughs) you would be like i'm brushing my teeth so much and instead of like having whiter teeth my gums hurt like because that's wrong brushing technique so you tend to with time understand okay like our insecurities play a big big role so the beauty standards and everything to keep up with it people just go to them definitely it's definitely uh an important point to consider so while you were doing all these things when you're in school, did you kind of have, like, how did you kind of balance everything you were doing? Because I'm, I'm going to go ahead and assume that dentistry is not a light uh, program to take. So how did you kind of balance all that? Did you kind of uh, have like a time management routine or a study routine that you tried to stick to? Or what did you kind of do to keep yourself balanced? So the first thing that my parents made sure that I'm in a hostel uh, set up that was like just five minutes from my college so that I have more time to myself rather than traveling back and forth from home. So my morning used to start usually at seven in the morning and my college was at eight. So I would have like get ready, have my breakfast and then head to my college. My college used to finish by four and we had a program which had a lot of assignments, clinical aspect that we had a quota, like in the sense you had deadlines to meet, you had a number of patients to do before you could pass that certain criteria. So all that made us more sincere, more organized and diligent with the work that we started to have time management in place from day one. Like finishing on time is when, if if we are not finishing, a, like suppose it's a carving situation, we are making a tooth. But if you're not able to finish it by the end of that one hour, our grades won't be put in. So all that from right from day one of my class, if I remember correctly, it's like I've always been stuck with it's this hour. I need to get this done as soon as possible. And yes, having a good diet and everything also added to it. When like work balance, again, when I came to this country, back in, back in India, we had help. We had house help. We had the parents and everything to take care of that aspect. But once we moved here, that was a challenging part, managing home, managing my work. And then on the weekends, I used to take my certification courses. So that's when I felt that, yes, having time management, having my finances managed and having a work-life balance is essential to have a peace of mind by the end of the day. You just don't want to keep working and struggling and being not able to be productive. Nobody wants that because you have to give your 100% to your work, 100% to your studies and 100% at home as well. Absolutely. So, yeah, my husband has been very helpful for that. He has like managed, like he used to make Excel sheets. I mean, I was pretty bad at it initially, but then he taught me like, okay, that's if this is your goal, this is what you want to pay for your tuition. This is what you want to do for your miscellaneous, maybe eat out or anything. You have to budget it mm-hmm. because money is limited. Time is limited. You cannot just exhaust your resources. So 
one has to be mindful about anything they do. Just have your mind put into it that, okay, I need to get this done and set realistic goals. Don't be unreal with yourself. Be true to yourself and ask yourself like, okay, is this required and prioritize things. So that's how I have been managing my life so far. Yeah, it sounds like you kind of learned pretty quickly how to discipline yourself. Like it sounds like a lot of that sounds like you learned a lot about self-discipline too. That's true. You have to like, if you don't take yourself seriously, nobody else would. Yeah. And especially if you're in post-secondary education, you have to discipline yourself because no one else is going to discipline you. That's correct. Yeah. Like we have in high school, um, in high school, you have your teachers saying, Hey, you didn't do your homework. Um, like, where's your homework? Or like, do you need extra help? Or you miss a test and they give you like a makeup assignment. And it's a lot of those things aren't there when you're in university. Like you're not, if you don't turn in an assignment, your professor's not going to chase you down and ask you for it. They're going to just, all right, this person didn't turn in their assignment and move on. And so you really, really need to be on top of yourself and make sure you're keeping yourself on track. And I know that's something that a lot of people really have to adjust to when they get to that level too. Yeah, you have to be self-motivated. If you are not, like like you said, nobody can pull you out of your room to get there to the class on time. Or Because if you miss a session, you miss it. You would miss the day of learning. So every day is new. And I think everybody should be sincere and be prepared that they have to finish everything. Not for anybody else, but for themselves first. Absolutely. Were there any other kind of challenges you faced when you were a student aside from that or any kind of obstacles you had to overcome while you were studying in school? Yeah, there were many. Um, One incident that I like recall right now is during my examinations. So we were supposed to have patients assessed a week prior or 10 days prior that, okay, we are going to treat this patient on the day of examination. That was for our professional final examinations. So I did everything, I set it up, I got the all the details of the patient and he promised that he would turn up on the day of the examination and then he didn't. And that was my my HOD did like got mad at me, like what just did happen? Like how how did this happen? How did how did he not turn up? And that was a moment that I felt, okay, it's not just about treating a patient, but also having, that's the first day I learned that I have to have a more closer, like a personal relation with the patient so that he can trust me. That was more on my part that maybe he didn't trust me enough that he didn't turn up. But then later on the day he did turn up, but that was because he had some other issues. But yes, I learned on the go that you have to have better communication with your patient, that it is important to be there on time. Maybe I wasn't vocal enough or I didn't make it sound so important so because it was my priority and not his those yeah. things were challenging in college so as and when like I said every day was a new day and every patient was a new patient and like they had their own kind of personalities so that was challenging to get through their head of what they want because if I'm doing a treatment they would just be okay you can do this but while doing it they would just change their mind no I don't want this done because it would be about maybe money or maybe not just about money also but about the time they would just randomly be like oh I want to go home so I learned how to first communicate with them make everything clear that this is what I'm doing this is how much time it would take this is what you have to do you have to come back or anything of that sort and get things more more organized and smooth for both of us so those were a little bit of challenges that I faced here and there Yeah, that communication is definitely important to build that trust with someone because you can't, um, you can't really like those two go very much go hand in hand. And again, communication is another one of those uh, skills that you don't, you have to learn through trial and error. And you have to kind of learn through that experience instead of just having someone tell you like, okay, communication is important, go try it out. Like you have to actually experience that to really understand why it's so important. Yeah. And it's, but it sounds like those were those kind of good challenges because they helped you kind of develop um, your own style of working with patients or whoever else. And it kind of, it sounds like there was a lot of um, lessons to be learned with that, with those kind of challenges too. 
yes, there were positive challenges and I could do a lot of changes in myself. Like I could analyze, like, how can I make a situation better? That, that improved my, not just my skills, but like also my personality, like how to be more welcoming to the patients, how to be, how to make them more comfortable with me. And then again, treat them correctly so that they can come back to me. So that is one thing that has still, like, I know a few patients of mine still call me to ask, like, how am I doing? So if you have that kind of a mindset that you're not just there for money, not just there, oh, I'm doing a service to you, but there to actually help somebody genuinely. Yeah, that's definitely must be a really great feeling when someone kind of remembers you and say, hey, how are you doing? I'm still thinking of you, even though like you were, you worked on my teeth. Yeah. (laughs) Because I mean, like, again, it's just like those going back to the people who uh, are afraid of dentists. Um. So yeah, just having that kind of impact on someone probably would be really worthwhile, I think. Yes, for sure. Um, So dentistry kind of aside, one of your other uh, kind of passions is that you are a travel blogger. Yeah. Um, So how did you kind of get it? Did you start that uh, while you were, did you do that while you were in school or is that kind of a more, I mean, I guess obviously right now, COVID aside, was that kind of how did you do, how did you end up getting into that? So uh, that was one of the passions I picked up during my school in India. That in my free time I would be either interested into playing sports, but then once I moved into a hostel, I didn't have that kind of time. But I or the energy, so I would just come back from my work and everything and take one or two hours to myself and get into writing. So I would. Because uh, whenever we had vacations, I would go and visit my father. He was posted to some state or the other. And I would like plan a trip to spend some time with him. So that's when I started to learn about how different provinces, like we call provinces here, there are states in India. So we, I would learn about the flora and fauna, about the cultures and the, because even India is diverse. It's, mm-hmm. you have hills, you have snow, you have desert, you have, rivers, waterfalls, whatnot. It's it's beautiful to experience all of that. So every time he would be posted to a new place, I would make sure I visit him, click a lot of pictures to show it to my friends and everything that I'm like, okay, I did this, 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 all activities over there. And he being a sports person himself and being an adventure junkie, I would say, <laughs> he would take me on different expeditions, take me to trails, or we would go river rafting, like parasailing, something or the other of that sort. That got me like intrigued, like, oh, I tell it to my friends and they all get so fascinated. Like not everybody gets an opportunity or maybe they are not aware to where to access these things. So once it started, like there's a place called Tawang, Tenga Valley. They, that nobody had heard of those places. That's in our country, east, very east of um, India. People haven't visited. It's not something like a commercial destination, tourist destination. So it was like untouched beauty and pristine and something that nobody had seen ever before because there's no documentation anywhere. So when I showed them those kind of pictures and that got them interested and they all wanted to sit and talk to me more about it, got me like, oh, I should write about it. I should like, like blog about it. So that, that's how it started, like more of uh, being my, like a journal, I would say putting my thoughts and my experiences, what I saw, what I felt, or what kind of people I met and what experiences I had with them. To that, then coming to, after graduating, I could travel across like India. And then after that, I went abroad. My first trip was to Singapore and we went to Maldives and then we went to Abu Dhabi and then we saw Dubai. I like, I was, uh, mesmerized wherever I went like the day I would just land the whole planning and everything just got me so interested and again the bu- budgeting part you're traveling you're managing your budget you're managing your you want to experience everything but you are on a budget yes all these things got me like to channel my thoughts and say like that that's when I said okay I want to be a full-fledged travel blogger that's my passion that that got me like a lot of experience exposure and I learned a lot during this whole five six years of my writing experience 
Yeah. So you really just wanted to kind of share all that collected information with other people and kind of show them stuff off the beaten path kind of thing. Yes. That's my, my aim. I would say also that I would like people say you'd have to have money, like a lot of money to maybe travel. But I would say no, like coming to this country, I would say it, traveling is not just about going to a destination, maybe I'm not just checking out into the fancy restaurants or hotels or something like that. It's more about the experience, seeing the nature, experiencing what that place has to offer to you. So that all happens when you're present in the place you're experiencing and then you can share it with your friends and family. So my ideas of influencing people to actually hold back, be in the moment, enjoy with what you have. Like COVID has taught me that certainly, like during the lockdown, you cannot go anywhere. Yeah. But then I discovered I have a river right across, like just 10 minutes walk from my place. Like it, you cannot just see it from your eyes. But once you go to the trail, I could, mm -hmm. oh, I found it like, and people were like, where's the river near your house? We never saw it. And that's like, you have to have that zeal in yourself and have that exploring nature in yourself that you want to learn or maybe just explore that area yeah yeah i think that's one of the positive things to come out of covid because i mean obviously no one is no one likes covid and everyone's sick of being in their house but one of, i think one of those positive things is that so many people are starting to appreciate what's in their own backyard a lot more because for the longest time and, and even right now uh, the only options really are just going to wherever's close to you or going to, you know, your hiking trail or wherever it is you're going. And a lot of people are starting to realize like, hey, this is a really cool area I live in and I never even thought to explore it. That's very true. That's something I, I would say I learned from my mother. She has been my greatest mentor and my teacher almost like during the days when we couldn't go out and my father would be away, posted somewhere. So she would take the initiative of making me feel comfortable in my own home, going to the backyard, having a rope kitchen yard. Like a lot of people don't even know where the produce comes from. Like they wouldn't even know how a potato grows, like something like small as that. You are, you're learning as you're seeing things. So that is something one should appreciate that with what you have, even if it's just a small, like a plant or something that you have in your house, you learn about it, Google it, learn how you can make it better. Something like as small as that can actually make a lot of difference in your life. I mean, it's not always about having to go to very fancy destinations, as I said. Even if you go to maybe a very exotic place, if you don't know about what you're going there for, imagine you're going to Maldives and you don't know what kind of um, marine life you're going to see there. So even if you're there, you won't be noticing it. Like if you're in the ocean, you won't know what fish or what it is. You're just seeing things, but not knowing what it is. So that's something like being blank to it. Like one should actually just do a little research, but I would say you have to like study a whole book yeah. of things, but just be, yeah, you're going to like try their cuisine, try their uh, cultural stuff, like their clothes or something like that. that that's going to like add some value to you and not just yeah. go there for that kind of a relaxation you must go for the relaxation but not just go with a blank mind yeah that's one thing I usually do anytime I go somewhere um I always kind of read up a bit I like spend a couple weeks before I leave uh reading up about kind of like the history of that place and learning a little more about it because I feel like for me when I learn and know at least not like I mean I'm not studying like books and books of it but just knowing that little backstory and knowing the history of a place makes me appreciate that experience a lot more because you go somewhere and you're like, wow, I'm walking in the footsteps of whoever else came before me or wherever, like depending on where you are and whatever. But um, and it, I feel like it just makes you appreciate the opportunity you're experiencing in that moment. And the um, just like the, the presence of the place you're in, I think. Yes, that's absolutely the thing. If you don't appreciate the thing that you're doing, it's pointless. So again, it's something that you put your mind into is when you would start appreciating it. 
Yeah, definitely. And how did you kind of start building up that blog? Like, did you, um, did you kind of just start the blog and then just kind of start sharing it to your friends or did you kind of just go full in and just put yourself out there? So it, it was initially a small thing that I started like writing and then sharing it with my friends and family. And then once I started to get good response from them is when I created a website for myself. And then I started going full uh, with it. Also, I became a lifestyle and a, a body positive influencer back home. So I had a lot of like um, issues with my own body image because yeah, there are certain stereotypes and there are certain way a person has to be or they have a beauty standard. But then again, I like competed in beauty competitions and won them. And then I got a chance to work with great brands in India to promote body positivity. So all these things got me to like, if I can add some value to somebody's life, why shouldn't I? It's not only about just my personal experience, but able to create that awareness, overall awareness about different aspects. So that's how I went full into it. And once I came into Canada, it, it's been very welcoming to me. And again, I continued with my blogging here as well. And I have worked with diverse brands from like, run by purely, I would say, white people to black people to multi from to my culture people. To, it's been such an amazing journey with them, working with them, interacting with them, what their ideologies are, what the brand is all about. So I like to associate with such people. If I believe in something, I would want to influence people to like, okay, I'm not influencing you to you have to buy this, but he has to experience it. And maybe just yeah, tell them about, okay, this thing is there, you can maybe like, for example, go for a vegan brand over a chemical brand. So something like as simple as that. Yeah, I think that um, if you're going to be an influencer or any type of, you know, online personality or content creator or anything like that, I do think that you, there is a responsibility there to, you um, be careful of what, make sure that what you're promoting is in line with your own values and as well as the things that you want to um, not push on other people, but you want to kind of influence other people toward because there is, you know, like sometimes the, like I, you hear those stories about influencers or people who just kind of get caught up in the whole promoting everything they can to just make as much money as they can. And then they end up promoting these really damaging products like those, weight loss teas and stuff that are really really dangerous and so I think that's really important. yeah so that's something I stand by and I've always stood by that if something doesn't work for me or uh, even if the brand has approached me or they have sent this stuff to me I won't put it up on my social media or I won't share it with anybody that okay you must give it a try because if it didn't work for me I'm sure it's not going to work for you so being a responsible influencer I feel that and I would would want to even share this with my other colleagues as well that please be true to yourself don't like scam people into believing that you could lose all that pound in just 28 day like we maybe having a tea it's, it doesn't work it doesn't work that way you have to make people aware maybe influence the way oh you do this exercise you follow this diet and you're going to achieve it that's true influencing and not scamming people into having some pill or something like that would work overnight. It doesn't. Yeah, I think that authenticity is what really makes um, really makes people stand out as people and not just fall into that. I want to be a celebrity kind of trap. Like being authentic is so important, especially today when everybody is on social media and there are so many like platforms that everyone uses and it's just there's a lot of it. So that authenticity is so important. Also, I think people should research more rather than just believing somebody. Like, we, our role is to influence, I agree. But yes, one has to do some research on the personal level because everybody is different. And sometimes things may work for me, but won't work for you. So one has to be aware of that aspect of life as well. Like, not everything is for everyone. But yes, you can get influenced. Yeah, I think the focus should be more on inspiring than influencing. And speaking of kind of um, inspiring, 
What is one of your favorite memories from your time, uh, whether in school uh, in India or retraining or anything like that? So there have been like many, many um, turning points. My parents have been my greatest influences and they have given me a lot of inspiration to do what I do. They have always taught me that if I dream it, believe it, I can achieve it. That's one thing that my father has repeatedly told me. And he has been a very strong pillar in my life. Seeing him serve the nation selflessly has inspired me a lot. That's something he does, not just as a job, but something he's passionate about. The same thing goes for my mom. She's a teacher. She she has done, like she's postgraduate in zoology. She could be a scientist or something, but she wanted to be a teacher and she just chose to be like a school teacher and educate people more about like basic sciences. And that all got me thinking like, it's not always about making money, but also doing something that you're passionate about. That's one inspiration I've taken from them. And I continue doing that. If I'm not happy doing something, I may not be able to continue doing it forever. So that's like, I would give that motivation to everybody. If you are passionate about doing it, you think you can and make this your career, that's when you should go for it. Even for blogging, there are a lot of people who have got into blogging now, seeing other people, oh, it's a lot of money, it's quick money, it's, you get a fame, you get a lot of influ- like stuff, this, that, and whatnot, a lifestyle maybe for that matter. But if you're not passionate doing it, you may discontinue it after a few months. You may not be consistent. And that's when your audience would just get to know instantly and they would lose that interest in you. So you have to first know yourself, what you are into, and that's when you're going to achieve it. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Like not just because a career is very, you know, financially rewarding, it doesn't mean it's going to make you happy. And it's, I mean, I've always believed that it's more important to be happy doing what you're doing than to make a lot of money. Because you could be, you know, as you would have all the money in the world, but if you're not happy, it, it, the money's going to mean nothing. That's that's very true. So it's something that my mom says, like even sometimes when the days, like even during this time, the pandemic has been very stressful for us. We are not able to meet them, but then she just keeps reminding me that the happiness lies within you. So if you are happy from within, everything around you will be. And always the idea of manifesting good thoughts. Mm-hmm. That's one thing one should always practice. Like I believe in the secret a lot. If people have read that book, uh, that's one book I really like reading time and again, just to uh, once again come back to reality that yes, good things do happen. It's not like the bad time will be always there. Yeah, I've been hearing that a lot in yeah. the last few months. That whole manifest mindset kind of thing, and just kind of putting out what you want to get back. And just using that, like, put, if you put positivity out there, it will come back to you. And I've been hearing that a lot. It does. A simple thing, like, now we do wear masks. If, yeah, if we don't, if you smile at somebody, the person would give you a weird look for a second, but then if he does smile back at you, it's something as that. So if you smile at the world, like, you, you manifest that you want this, you're happy. So even though everything would work for you, it will be happier for you. So if you think you're miserable, you're not well or something like that, you would you would certainly get up every day thinking I'm not well or I'm feeling sick because that's what you've been constantly thinking. Even if you're not, you're just going to manifest it to multifolds like, and that's going to affect you like, and get you to rock bottom. So no, no, nobody should do that. Don't put yourself down. That's what I feel. Nobody should do that. Yeah, I think that's what kind of why a lot of people really, really swear by the positive affirmations and just like every morning telling yourself, you know, I am worthy or whatever you have want to say to yourself, because the, the more you, it's all about how you feel that like, it's, it's about the way that you change your own mind to think. So if you really, really believe something you, it will start to just happen. Yeah, that's true. And you have like, again, you have to dream it to achieve it. If Absolutely. you don't, it's not going to happen. Exactly. 
Um, and speaking of kind of life advice, one of the questions that we always ask our podcast guests is, uh, if you could go back and talk to your 15 year old self, what would you say to yourself or what advice would you give yourself? That advice I would still give to myself now is stress less, worry less and work more. I, uh, I'm working on it and it's a constant process, but yes, stressing and like just getting worried about things or just overthinking about what will happen in the future is not going to help. It, it doesn't, it never helped. And that's the only main thing I would tell my 15 year old said, like, come on, you got it. You just have to relax, focus, maybe just make prioritize things and you're going to do it. You're going to achieve it. So that's number one advice I would give to myself. Also self-love. <laughs> Love yourself more, be more positive and everything will fall in place eventually. Yeah, I think that's super important. I mean, a lot of teen, that's something a lot of teenage, especially teenage girls, uh, but teenagers in general really, really struggle with the whole self-love and just accepting yourself for who you are and not uh, worrying about, you know, what the popular kids think of you or what the other kids at school think and just being comfortable in yourself. And I think that's obviously a really big issue with teenagers, especially, but, and, and adults too, I guess. Yes, it is. The idea of fitting in has uh, made it difficult for people to actually believe in self-love. But why to fit in when you can stand out? I mean, you can just be yourself and you should actually be your best self so that people can like you the way you are and not just be a people pleaser. Yeah, like people who like you for who you are are going to be those really true friends that add so much value to your life. And if you're friends, if you're going to be friends with someone based on what they think that you are instead of who you actually are, like those are not going to be uplifting or, you know, just valuable friendships in general, because it's based on false information, pretty much. Agreed. Agreed. So you should have your, I don't say that you should be um, maybe a rebel or something of that sort, but have a mind of your own, have your own personality, have your own thoughts, speak it out, be, for that, yes, you have to have self-love and self-confidence first. That what you think and believe in is something that you can put it out to others. Don't be afraid to be judged, it's okay. If somebody is meant to be in your life, a friend or a family, anybody for that matter, will be there for you when it's like, when it's about, not just about, being like compatible to them, but about your mental mind and wavelength to match as well. So you will find the right people in your life, have true friends in your life, only when you believe in yourself and have that confidence in yourself. Okay, I'm this way. Yes, I, I don't say that you have to be stubborn, but then you have to be able to align your thoughts correctly. If I put it that way. That, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And I mean, that's... Um... I kind of just lost my train of thought there, but that kind of thing of, of if you are afraid to say something, like say you're, you really like something that maybe isn't like popular or something like that. If you're trying to hide some aspect of your personality because you're afraid of your friends judging you for it and you think that they would judge you for it, then they're obviously not good friends in the first place. Yeah, it's better to have one friend than so many. That's what I feel. Like one true friend is all you need a person, a true person who can hear you out, who can speak your heart to and be your true self. You don't want a bunch of friends who are just there for the sake of it. You want somebody who genuinely thinks good for you and adds some good, like you add positivity to their life and they add positivity to your life. That's what, that's my idea of having my set of like people around me. If they're, they're, they're happy, if it's something like being happy for someone, if they achieve something, I, I should be very happy for them. And that should be the vice versa for them. Like if I do something in my life, they should be happy for me and not like be bugged or something like that. Or jealous. So that's, or jealous. So yeah, I don't want to use that word yeah. because I, yeah, it's a very negative word. But then, yes, that's, that's true human nature, being envious, being vicious, being jealous, all those things shouldn't be there between friends that's not your true friend if they are like that they are not your true friends it's better to be up like away from them <laughs> yeah and I mean, if you're not going to be happy for someone for something then obviously you don't actually genuinely care about them because when you care about people 
you're happy when they're happy. Yeah, that's the whole idea. Like, that's pretty much my kind of friend circle I have is like, we all have each other's back. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that's, I knew my next question was going to be, um, what advice would you give to a student just starting in their first year of university or college? But honestly, I really think that everything you just said is really helpful advice for a first year college student as well. So like, I'm pretty sure that is um, probably one of the most important things to remember um, when you're starting to, when you're a freshman student or whatever. And the main idea is one should enjoy your college, be open to learning, be open to challenges, and things are going to change. Like you said, in school, we have teachers telling us to do this and that. University is a different life. You won't be told to do everything. It's all about being self-disciplined and self-motivated. So that's one advice I would give everybody that from day one, be true to yourself that I'm here for a purpose. And not just to like, because these years won't come back. Your foundation years don't come back. Absolutely. And that that's important to remember too, right? Like that they're, they're not like make and break your future, but they really are so, so important as to how you form. Because I really believe that in university, those are your years where you really discover who you are and they're very formative years for how you're going to set yourself on a path in the future and how you're going to um, just develop yourself as a person. So I think that is really important to remember that aspect of it. Yeah, like you would just be surprised that a lot of us who think like for me, I was always uh, like under my, my parents shield or I was protected and I didn't have that opportunity. Like I did have opportunities, but then I wasn't sure I could do it. But once I was in the college, I was a leader. Like I could be a coordinator or a student body member or something that I could speak for like 10 or hundred more people. So that is something that is discovered during college. Like I have that much, I developed that much confidence in myself that I could do those specific tasks all by myself. So those things you would be like, people get surprised by themselves once they discover who they truly are and what, how much strength they have inside them. I also think that's why the friendships you make in university last so long too, is because you're this, that's really that time where you start to discover yourself and you, you know, you do all of those things that we were just talking about and you meet the people who are in that same phase of their life and they're, you know, they've, they are starting to define who they are. So you really kind of figure out who you mesh really well with and that point. And a lot of those university friendships, like they're very long lasting and they last for a long time. That's, that's absolutely true. Like all my friends that I like, because I traveled so much and I would spend just a couple of years with my friends. I never had that long lasting relation with a lot of friends, but during college, like four or five years, you're at one place, you're in the same hostel, you're together, you're 24 seven together. You understand the person better, you make better bonds. And that's when you understand how everybody thinks, like that's how you make good relation. So yeah, it's been quite a journey. That must've been really hard. Like now that I just thought that you just said that, like that must've been really hard growing up when you were, when you lived in so many different places and going from different cities, like that must've been really hard to um, make those friends and have like those uh, childhood friends and all that. Like it must've just have to keep restarting pretty much everywhere you go. Yeah, I had to restart very, pretty much very early growth. And like, they were, again, like if it's different um, cities and people are different, they're food is different everything like connecting to them it was like not that challenging because my parents were very helpful or very support. like they would like tell me you can do it this way or that way and then I would be okay I can do it I'll be good for the first day and I was like pretty easygoing happy child I could make friends easily I was very popular in my class everywhere <laughs> so I didn't have like problem making friends but yes um at times I would be very scared to like open my heart or pour my heart out to somebody yeah. so because it's something you develop over a period of time and by the time I would like develop that trust in someone is like I have to pack my bags <laughs> but yeah I have been in touch with all my friends 
to have been very close to me, very supportive to me. And I've learned a lot through them. So everywhere I went, I've made good friends and I cherish them for my life. Yeah, I guess that's also the flip side is that the more places you go, the more friends you have because you, <laughs> you just collect them all. <laughs> <laughs> so I have like friends from all ethnicities also. <laughs> so it's fun. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Like that not a lot of people really have that opportunity to just have so many different uh, friends and people from all different walks of life uh, as your friends. And like, that just gives you like so many um, experiences or just kind of a, so many different perspectives on things even. So like, that's really awesome. Apart from my university friends, all my other friends are into different professions. So when I talk to them, it's not just about my profession, it's about everything. It's like wholesome. So it feels nice not just to talk about the same old thing and like know more about what's going on in other places like other fields so that's that's nice for me as well also like my mind is not limited to one side I can think in different ways even for example now my husband is my best friend so he tells me about his uh, job and his profile he's into engineering so I learned a lot I was never aware of certain things and it's always interesting conversations to have yeah and you just like learn one, you get a break from talking about your own profession all the time, because I'm sure you don't want to talk about dentistry 24 hours a day. And you just learn the other things too. And like you learn stuff from other people. So it's kind of a win-win. Yes. <laughs> so another question that we kind of ask everyone on our show is if you have a favorite motivational quote that you would like to share. I would say it's like, make your life your masterpiece. You just have one life, live it to the fullest and work on every aspect of it so that you don't regret it. Yeah, yeah. that's one that I live by. Because like seeing even during the pandemic, it's so unpredictable. You have to live one day at a time. You cannot just keep worrying about the future and not live the present. So that's one thing I really has reinforcing myself again 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 yeah that's definitely something that's been a big factor in the pandemic is um you know being given these circumstances that no one expected no one wanted and no one asked for it and you know nobody is enjoying it but you know you there are so many things that you can do just to you know work on your own quality of life with what you have right now and like for a lot of people that might mean you know, learning a new skill or um, doing something to pass the time or taking up a new hobby. And for other people, it might just be, you know what, I'm just going to relax this whole time. I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to like lay on my couch or binge watch Netflix or whatever. And whatever you do to make your life worth living is it, like during these times is absolutely more than okay. Yeah. Like for me, it was just slowing down my life. Like when I moved, I had so much on my hand, like with the job, school, managing everything. Once I got an opportunity to slow down, I could discover more. I could explore more of the place I'm going to spend my rest of my life in. So yeah, that's, I take it positively. So one has to have a positive attitude about everything. Yeah, definitely important to have a positive attitude right now. And just in general, at all times, I think. So yeah, that's definitely a really, really great quote to share. Um, and my one last question uh, is another more fun question that we like to ask. And that is, what is your favorite social media platform and why? So currently, I'm hooked to Instagram. And I love Instagramming. I'm pretty active there. And the other app I like is TikTok. I'm not fond of making a lot of videos. I'm yep. still developing that skill, I would say. I'm still learning and trying to ace that. But yeah, those are two platforms I like. It's it's silly. Like uh, on TikTok, once it started, you could get hooked for hours. But then I started to learn life hacks. <laughs> Imagine like that. So it's been um, very interesting to learn things from different people around the world and within 15 seconds you're picking up oh this can be done this way too something like that so these are two, two of my favorite platforms like instagram for my pictures for my blogging for my mm -hmm. travel pictures and everything of that sort getting to know a lot of people i have not met them personally but i came across a lot of girls from toronto and then i've made friends so that's one thing that i 
I really like about social media is like you can become like make friends from anywhere in the world. So I've made friends from Europe. I've made friends from Germany. I've made friends from Toronto, from US, and India, and like, all those countries. And it's interesting to get to know how they are having what's going on in their country and how they are coping up with the time. So all this, if you use social media to your advantage, it is a good platform. Yeah, to interact and socialize. Yeah, it's definitely a bonus to be able to. That's definitely one of the really great positive things about social media is that you can connect with people all over the world and make friends everywhere, and it just opens you up to so many things that we never had opportunities for before and even just like before the internet or whatever even just before while we had the internet maybe not social media um those kind of thing yeah because now people have time they are able to and plus i think people have gone more expressive and they are letting things there on the social media do you want to drop your social or your instagram handle so that our listeners can follow you Yeah, so my social media handle is Arushi S Soni. It's A R U S H I S S O N I, and you can follow me on Instagram. And I have the blog by the name The Gypsy Girl Things. Being a vagabond, and that's how I came up with that name, The Gypsy Girl Things. So you can find me on Google. You can find me on Instagram. Yeah, we'll link those. We'll link those as well, and um, of course, we'll tag you in. Uh, the post so people can see you and keep up with your adventures. Um, so just before we wrap up and say goodbye, is there any other uh, final things you want to say? I know we shared a lot already, but is there anything else you will kind of want to say uh, just before we wrap up? So I would just say it's all about enjoying your life. Don't be stressed about anything that you have to achieve in a limited amount of time. Everything happens in a time zone. what may happen to you at a definite time may happen to somebody at a definite other time so don't like mix or compete with other people's timelines that's one thing i i feel like for me uh, i take it this way that if i'm able to achieve this in such an amount of time may not happen to somebody else it's all about your circumstances so don't pressurize yourself take life easy be good to yourself have self love have positive attitude and you're going to have everything that you always desire. I think that is uh an amazing thing uh, a, a great place to leave off but also just very um important for people to remember and it's very crucial um especially given circumstances right now. So um I really appreciate that. Thank you again for uh taking your time out of your day today even though it is a holiday here in Canada. Um so thank you so much for joining me today and sharing all of this uh amazing insights because a lot of what you said is very motivating and helpful and I think people are really going to like hearing it. So thank you so much. And we'll keep in touch with you and let you know what the next steps are and all that. So thank you so much. Have a good day. Yeah. Have a good rest of your day. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Bye.